When Livia Drusilla married Caesar Augustus in 39 BC, she was approximately three months pregnant with her second son. Her first son, Tiberius, who was only four years old at that time, had spent most of his young life on the run with his parents, fleeing the terrors of the proscriptions enforced by dictate of the Second Triumvirate. Tiberius was named for his father, Livia's first husband, Tiberius Claudius Nero, who had raised a slave army to aid Fulvia Flaccabambula, the woman who had attempted to overthrow the Second Triumvirate. But his father Nero's forces were defeated by the legions of Marcus Agrippa when Tiberius was only one year old, causing Nero to flee to Sicily with his son Tiberius and wife Livia, where Sextus Pompeius took them in along with the other political refugees who had escaped Rome. From Sicily, mother and son later followed him to Greece, where Livia's husband endeavored to negotiate an alliance between Sextus Pompeius and Marcus Antonius. However, no accord was reached, and once again the family was forced to flee, this time from the besieged town of Sparta, in a flight to safety which nearly ended in the loss of their lives in a forest fire. Mercifully, it was soon after that Livia Drusilla, who was now pregnant with her second child, could finally go home. An agreement had been reached between the Second Triumvirate and Sextus Pompeius, bringing an end to the famine and the prescriptions. The Treaty of Mycenae was signed in 39 BC. Almost immediately upon returning to Rome, Livia Drusilla met Augustus, then known as Caesar D.V. Filius, who was also married and who had a pregnant wife himself. But before long, it was obvious that the two were lovers, leaving Caesar's pregnant wife in great distress. Livia's husband, Tiberius Claudius Nero, was also cast aside, while the loss of his wife was coldly compensated. The properties that had been proscribed by the Second Triumvirate were now restored to him in exchange for his agreement to divorce Livia and cheerfully bear the humiliation of giving her away on her wedding day. After Caesar's wife, Scribonia, gave birth to his daughter, Julia, Caesar D.V. Filius also formally divorced, dismissing Scribonia and her children by a previous marriage from his home. The newborn Julia was snatched from the arms of her mother and given over to Caesar's new love. When by approximately 34 BC, Livia had given her new husband only a single stillborn child, and rumors persisted that her husband sought to negotiate a new marriage for himself with the daughter of a Dacian king, Livia ventured to attach herself to Marcus Agrippa, the military genius behind her husband's victories. She arranged this by betrothing her son, Tiberius, to Vitsania, the daughter of Agrippa. Should Augustus divorce her on the grounds that she was barren, at least she would have the protection of Agrippa. Then in 25 BC, Livia's husband, Caesar Augustus, suddenly assumed control with her son Tiberius, as well as taking charge of Marcellus, the son of Caesar's sister, Octavia, and began directing their military training by way of Hispania's Cantabrian Wars. Upon the return of the young men from war, and upon the advisement of Augustus, Tiberius was named Questa and Marcellus was named Aedile. Both boys were given special privileges, as both boys were potential legacy makers for Augustus. Tiberius was granted the right to run for public offices five years before he would be of legal age, while Marcellus was given the advantage of a ten-year head start up the political ladder. But the legions grumbled at the prospect of the world's greatest military falling into the hands of some Claudian youth named Marcellus, whose only qualification was his relationship to Augustus. Didn't all this harken back to the days when Roman legions were forced to fight and die because of the fancy of some young and pampered son of a patrician? And it was not only the legions seeing Augustus through battle-hardened eyes. After the mysterious death of Marcellus and the marriage of Augustus's daughter to Agrippa, Livia Drusilla had reason to finalize the long-standing betrothal agreement that her son Tiberius formally wed Agrippa's daughter, Vitsania. Yet, as the extended family politics saw multiple marriages morph into factions, Livia Drusilla chose to play her cards another way. As Augustus's sister Octavia gathered the last remnants of Antonian supporters around her, 
Marrying them to her Antonian and Claudian children, Livia saw it all through a different lens. As the wife of Caesar Augustus, Livia Drusilla was already attached to the Julii, so long as she didn't find herself suddenly divorced. Through her son Tiberius' marriage to Vitsania, Livia's family was allied with the Vitsaniae, and through her second son Drusus' marriage to Octavius' daughter, Antonia, they were also now related to the Antoniae. As the family dynamics evolved into competing bloodlines and clouds gathered on the horizon of Rome's emerging marital alliances, Livia Drusilla found many ports in the storm. But no one could have predicted the response of Caesar Augustus. Not only did he find ways to remove some Antonian supporters from the household of his sister Octavia, he also used the death of her son, Marcellus, to magnify the importance of the descendants of Julius Caesar, gradually weaving a thread of sentimentality and mythology into the historical memory. Ultimately, Livia's husband succeeded in driving his sister Octavia from Rome altogether, explaining away her sudden retirement to Velletri, the hometown of the Octavii, as the desperate move of a mother struggling with perpetual grief of the loss of her son. Then Caesar Augustus changed the balance of power between himself and the Vitsaniae by adopting his grandsons, Gaius and Lucius. Now the heirs to Rome's military might carry both the name of Caesar and the blood of Agrippa. Senate and legions alike could easily get behind heirs who were the offspring of both men. Standing back and studying it all was Livia Drusilla, a woman who had observed an undeniable truth. The legions who had favored Agrippa overshadowed the Senate who had supported Marcellus. Was not even her powerful Augustus at their mercy? Men with weapons will always triumph over men without them. If Livia's sons, Tiberius and Drusus, hoped to have any chance of success within Rome's imperial family, they needed to achieve glorious military careers over political appointments handed to them by their stepfather. To that end, Tiberius had already made inroads. Not only had he performed well in Hispania, being given the honor of acting as aedile for the founding of Augustus's new city, Augusta Emerita, but he later accompanied Livia's husband to the east, where he played a surprise role in Parthia's return of Rome's military standards. Serving under Agrippa, Tiberius had marched a large force of legions into Armenia on orders from Caesar Augustus to install Tigranus III on the throne. Tigranus III was the grandson of Tigranus the Great, and the son of Artavastes II, whom Cleopatra had brutally beheaded after the Battle of Actium. Armenia's throne had been claimed by Artavasdes' eldest son, Artaxias II, who had failed to rescue his father from the clutches of Marcus Antonius, and had sided with Parthia. As Caesar Augustus was preparing to travel to the Euphrates River to negotiate the return of Rome's standards, he thought it prudent to remove any threat of a surprise Parthian attack by promptly transforming Armenia into a Roman buffer state. For this reason, Tiberius was instructed to remove the pro-Parthian Artaxias and replace him with his pro-Roman younger brother, Tigranes. However, when the Armenian people learned that Rome's legions were on their way, they took matters into their own hands. A cabal of pro-Roman supporters within Armenia's royal court carried out the sudden assassination of Artaxias II. By the time Tiberius arrived in Armenia, the throne was vacant. Tigranes III became king of Armenia without a blow being struck. At the official ceremony, Tiberius crowned the newly ordained king with his own hands, after which King Tigranes surrendered to him all the spoils of war which had been won by the previous king Artaxias. In addition to gold and other wealth, these spoils included three of Rome's missing standards, likely seized by the enemy during Marcus Antonius's defeat in Media Atropatine. Tiberius returned to Rome covered in glory. The people were so overjoyed to have even some of the standards restored to Rome that the Senate ordered a public thanksgiving, as if Tiberius had single-handedly won a great victory on the battlefield. Tiberius, the eldest son of Livia Drusilla, who was both stepson of Caesar Augustus and son-in-law of Marcus Agrippa, was well on his way to making a name for himself where it mattered, 
within Rome's indomitable legions. Now it was the hour for Livia's second son, Drusus, to embark on his military career. Only by winning the high praise, respect, and admiration of Rome's legions could Livia's sons ever hope to protect themselves should their military successes arouse the ire of their illustrious stepfather.